A good afternoon to you, whoever you are and wherever you are, as we share in this most unusual of moments, namely an online virtual UFM family conference, an experience forced on us by the restrictions of lockdown. Nevertheless, it will hopefully prove to be a profitable one as we enjoy a measure of online fellowship and have opportunity, as we do in this session, to bring ourselves under the ministry of the Word of God. I am sitting here in my study, in my home, in the village of Les Mahago in Scotland, and I count it a great delight to be able to minister the truth of the Word of God to you this afternoon, on this the second day of our virtual conference. Apologies that I am unable to speak to you in live fashion, but other commitments need me to be elsewhere today. Now, any study of Mark 16 verses 1 to 8, and I trust that you've read those verses in advance, any study of this portion of scripture will always prove to be an enriching experience. How could it possibly be otherwise, when it records for us such splendid details as give us the opportunity to thrill and glory in the wonderful and inspiring reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the clutches of the doom and darkness of death. And it therefore follows that it is my prayerful hope that our study of Mark 16, as we consider the encouragements of Hallelujah Ministry, will for us prove to be as people committed to missionary endeavour will prove to be heartwarming, mind enriching and a soul uplifting experience of a marvellously faith strengthening and energising kind. Now a lot of the action in Mark 16 you will know draws our attention to the women who made their way to the tomb after the crucifixion in order to give tender, loving care to the dead body of Jesus. We can notice in the passing that theirs was firstly the, the privilege of ministering to Peter. Through their reporting of the event of the resurrection, he would discover that after his threefold denial of Jesus, he was not beyond the blessing of knowing forgiveness and restoration. The women, the women were told, go to the disciples and Peter. He was not to be excluded after his denial of Christ. So this was the privilege of ministering to Peter. Secondly, we could notice in the passing that theirs was the privilege of ministering to the disciples by directing them to Galilee and to an inspiring and life-transforming meeting with the risen Christ. Well, thirdly, we could also say that theirs was the privilege of ministering to us. And this by means of our viewing uh, in their lives the very moment, and an honestly reported one at that, such as saw them fleeing from the tomb, and in doing so, revealing much of fearfulness on their part. It was an exit revealing of a properly natural and human response to an encounter with supernatural reality. We read in verse 8, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually, they had been rocked by all that they had seen and heard at the tomb. Their encounter with the supernatural, namely the empty tomb, and of course the angel come from God, had swept them to a place where their minds found it hard to compute and make sense of all that they had seen and heard and indeed powerfully felt. Their minds had been stretched beyond the range and scope of such function as normally allowed them to make sense of the world they lived in. Is it any wonder then that theirs was trembling 
and bewilderment as they fled from the tomb in silence and fear, saying nothing to anyone because they were afraid, truly afraid, literally afraid. It was surely with good reason then that Mark ended his gospel with what we could call this honest moment, summed up in three words found at the end of verse 8. They were afraid. In other words, the gospel writer would have us know that an encounter with supernatural reality and the God who is the source of it is no light matter. And yet it seems that there was someone who felt that the gospel needed something of an extended ending to ensure that it finished, as it were, with a more upbeat gospel bang. Hence the addition of verses 9 to 20, material given to inspirational instruction. You find it there in verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. The church need not be in any doubt as to its chief responsibility and duty while here on earth. It is not here that it might be a resource for sound bites when the media comes a calling, nor is it here primarily to give itself to the practice of making political statements, such as sees it taking sides during moments of political controversy in the land when the various parties are at each other's throats. What's unusual about that? But neither is it here, the church, to give itself to the popular practice of virtue signalling, and this by enthusiastically jumping on every passing change society for the good bandwagon, doing so in an attempt to gain the approval of a fallen world or the admiration of those who like to imagine themselves as being on the cutting edge of what we could term woke culture. The word woke is very much in fashion these days. The word woke being the self-descriptive and self-congratulatory term used by such people as like to imagine themselves as being the most socially aware, socially sensitive and socially active people on the planet, especially in relation to the evil of racism and the need for social justice to rule the day. In their mind, wisdom to make the world a better place belongs to them and to no one else. The reason being that imagining themselves to be the best of all people, they alone are woken, or as they term it in bad English, woke to the needs of the day. In other words, they are awake, or to use their own pretentious word, woke to the real needs of the day, while everyone else, believe it or not, in their estimation, is still fast asleep. Well, let us be absolutely clear on the role of the church. It does not see itself as a political force, nor does it jump on passing bandwagons, and neither does it feel the need to cozy up to the woke propagandists of the day. Rather, it is the high calling of the church to honour the privilege granted to it by God himself. Namely, that of going into the world. That is the privilege granted by God. Ours is the privilege of going into the world and giving of ourselves and the church giving itself to the preaching of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to all creation. It is the gospel that has the power to put an end to racism 
It is the gospel of God that sets standards of honesty, integrity and righteousness for those who have the rule over us. It is the gospel of God that not only demands justice for all men, but also reveals what it looks like while telling us how to go about establishing it. The need of our day is for a church united and fully committed to the preaching of the soul-saving, life-transforming and society-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. We know this truth, don't we? We are people who are missionary oriented. We are people involved in the work of going into the world in order to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know the truth that makes a difference. We know what people need to hear. We know the power of God unto salvation made known in the gospel of Christ. That powerful gospel, able to change lives, able to transform societies. We know the work we are involved in. So we can relate to these added words in this extra ending to Mark 16. But of course, we also find in the extra verses of Mark's gospel that there is material given over to inspirational clarification. In verses 17 and 18, God's servants would know, will know, power in their lives. They would drive out demons. They would speak in unlearned languages. They would enjoy divine protection and be able to heal the sick. Inspirational truth. And then in verse 19, of course, there is inspirational revelation, such as would detail our Lord's experience of being gathered up into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. We can see that event surely in our mind's eye. Christ rising up in glory and majesty to take his place in the highest heights of heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, there to rule over all that he created. It's inspirational to see the Lord upon the throne of glory. He is the one we serve. It's exciting. It's enthralling to see him there on the throne. You can see why this was added to the ending. It's inspirational revelation. But there's also in verse 20 what we could call inspirational stimulation. This relating to the fact that the Lord works through his people and keeps his promise to honour with mighty power the preaching of his word. Now, all of this is wonderful truth, but the fact remains that it is not the way Mark chose to end his gospel. Rather, it was with good reason that he closed with the words, they were afraid. You see, the woman's experience is a reminder to us that it is the way of God to deal with his people in awe-inspiring, soul-humbling, mind-stunning, heart-warming and life-changing fashion. To be in the presence of the supernatural is to know that we are out of our comfort zone. Suddenly we realise that we are not as we imagined ourselves to be. The Lord over our own life or even the master of our own destiny. We begin to sense our inadequacy, to recognise our frailty and to be convinced and persuaded of the reality of our sinfulness. And all of this, and much more besides, as we begin in our hearts and minds to sense and know something of the breathtaking grandeur of the glory and majesty of God. But there is more in terms of the women's ministry to us. And it has to do with what 
I'm going to call a hallelujah moment. A hallelujah moment. As we have noted already, some people are struck and worried by the abrupt ending to Mark's gospel. They are disturbed by the fact that the note of joy seems to be missing and that it ends with the stark statement, they were afraid. They imagine that this is not a suitable ending to a wonderful gospel, to an exciting gospel, to an inspiring and spiritually energising gospel. It needs something else, they think. These words are not appropriate. This is not a good ending. They were afraid. But I'm of the mind that viewed properly, Mark's gospel does end on a high note. One that ministers to us a hallelujah moment. I want you to notice that there is hallelujah ministry in the dynamic of the women. Yes, hallelujah ministry in the dynamic of the women. I want you to use your imagination in order that you might see the women emerging from the tomb. Their exit was not slow or laboured, as though they still felt weighed down by the burden of the reality of the death of their Lord. They were not weighed down by the overwhelming grief they had felt on the way to the tomb. Notice that Mark describes their exit with these words. The women went out and fled. It strikes me that there is something of joyful determination and dynamic being implicitly described in these words. It was with determination and not hesitancy that they went out, and it was with dynamic that they fled. I see these women all but, if I can put it this way, exploding out of the tomb. All sense of physical weariness and heart heaviness gone. Theirs it was to know again, something of bubbling joy flooding their lives. Indeed, Matthew reports such in his gospel. And this when he tells us of the women that they hurried from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. Matthew 28 verse 8. Can you see them then bursting from the tomb, rushing away from the presence of the angel with their robes flying and billowing behind them? All the while, their bewildered minds were desperately trying to come to terms with all that they had seen and heard and felt. It was a special moment. And in touching the women, God had given new dynamic to their lives, giving us cause to say hallelujah as we are reminded that the, re the, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus is a resource that empowers and gives purpose to our living. We have known resurrection power. We knew it in the moment when by the sovereign working of the amazing and powerful grace of God, we were released from the captivity of sin rescued from the clutches of the evil one, renewed spiritually and added to the family of the redeemed, making us the children of God on earth. Those who know his power at work in their lives, that's who we are, raised men and women, raised from the death and darkness and doom of sin. We have been made new by the grace of God and we know this and we believe it and we are experiencing it 
every day that we draw breath. We are the children of God and we have something to tell the world. Hence our involvement in missionary endeavour. Hence our praying for missionaries. Hence our being missionaries. Hence our being men and women who desire to see souls being saved under the preaching of the word of God being saved by the grace of God. We have known that experience. We are the children of God on earth. What incredible status belongs to us. We are sons and daughters of God. We are steeped in the holiness of Christ. We have been justified. We are the beloved and cherished ones of God. Isn't it marvellous to be a Christian? Even as we live in a fallen world, we are the children of God. Those who know his power at work in our lives. Incredible and awesome power. Power made known in and illustrated by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus from the dead. Power, able to meet our needs, strengthen our faith, and carry us onward and upward as the glory-bound children of God. We must never forget that we have spiritual dynamic in our lives. Days can be difficult on the mission field. Things don't seem to be happening. There are many who would move against us oppose us, but we must never forget that we have spiritual dynamic in our lives, such as gives power and purpose and passion to them. We serve a resurrected and glorious Lord, and great is the gospel truth we have to declare. Christ died for the sins of needy men and women. On the third day, he rose again. And it is gospel truth that all who come to him in repentance and faith will have their sins forgiven. Hallelujah. We have dynamic in our lives because like the women who fled from the tomb with the gospel in their heart, we have discovered the truth about the resurrection and have the gospel in our hearts. The tomb is empty. Christ has risen. And we have known the touch of dynamic resurrection power upon our lives. We are the resurrected ones of God. And as such, at the end of our lives, we know that the power of God, as it raised us in the past from spiritual death, will on some day in the future raise us from physical death. Yes, we will be carried into glory. Hallelujah. We need also to notice that there is hallelujah ministry in the direction of the women. When they left that tomb, they did so with great urgency and purpose. Their mission being to go directly to where they thought they would find the disciples. They would suffer no distractions and there would be no stopping for casual conversations or the gossipy recounting of what they had seen and heard. In good fashion, they were properly afraid to do anything other than than what they had been commanded to do. How sad then that so many Christians fail to follow their example, being all too ready to do the things they have not been commanded to do, while giving no real time or effort to doing the things that God has commanded them to do. As for the women who fled from the tomb, their actions bore evidence to the fact that they were women under orders and they would not be happy until they had taken the news of the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus and the details of the promise of God to the disciples. 
Again, theirs is ministry that prompts us to cry out, Hallelujah! And this, when we see their commitment to travelling in the direction that God had set for their lives. A commitment of direction that would serve to make them a blessing to others, such as would in turn bring blessing to their own souls. And this because there is joy to be experienced when we make it our way to travel in the direction of those who need to hear the glorious truth of the wonderful resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the faithful ministry of the women in relation to the command of God, and we have cause to cry, Hallelujah! Next, though, we need to notice that there is Hallelujah ministry in the declaration of the women. To hear the intended content of their declaration to the disciples is for us to have cause to cry out, Hallelujah! And the content that stirs us to joy as it prompts celebration and encourages the exuberant exclamation of heartfelt hallelujahs is the glorious truth that we hear. The tomb is empty. It could not hold our Lord in the captivity of death and darkness. And of course, his discarded grave clothes in equal fashion bear eloquent testimony to the same supernatural reality. We have great truth to glory in. Jesus Christ has defeated the powers of sin and death as he promised he would. Hallelujah! The word he gave was a true word. He said he would rise again and he did. Hallelujah! His was a prophetic word and a fulfilled word. Hallelujah! He knew that his Father in heaven would not abandon him to the grave, nor let him know decay. And he was right. He conquered death. Hallelujah! And does not Paul tell us of Jesus, that by his resurrection from the dead, he is declared to be the very Son of God? Hallelujah! Do we not also know that he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? the one in whom all who love him and belong to him will be made alive again, knowing in death the power of supernatural resurrection unto eternal life. Hallelujah! Death cannot hold the people of God, and Christ our Lord is the proof of this reality. Hallelujah! The declaration of the women would bring hallelujah ministry to bear on the disciples. It would give their lives new passion. Christ was alive. It would give their lives new purpose. Go to Galilee. Be about the Lord's work. It would give their lives new promise. There you will see him. The declarative ministry of the women would give to the disciples in due time the opportunity to exult in the power, majesty and glory of their Lord. So that a cry would take shape in their hearts before erupting from within with all the passion of their being. Can you guess the word? Hallelujah! And that is a cry that finds echo in our own hearts as we head towards our place and time of meeting with the risen Lord. Hallelujah! Finally, though, we need to notice that there is hallelujah ministry in the destiny of the women. On Good Friday, the day of the cross, their hearts had been broken in two as they watched Jesus give himself over to death. On sad Saturday, they had surely plunged more deeply into the experience of despair and depression as they imagined their Lord to be lost to them for all time. But then came Resurrection Sunday, and for the women and those to whom they would have the privilege of ministering, namely Peter, the disciples, and in time us, it was a day full of destiny a day that would see defeat turned into victory, tears of sadness turned into tears of joy, 
Disciples full of fear and empty of hope turned into disciples full of courage and overflowing with hope. Resurrection Sunday was a day of destiny for the people of God. It marked the beginning of a new day, life to be lived in the victory, power and light of the resurrection, glorying in the truth that Christ has risen from the dead. Such historical reality as gives us cause to cry, hallelujah. New beginning, life lived in the holy service of God to the enthusiastic and committed declaring of his glorious gospel. And this and to extending his kingdom into the four corners of the world, to the saving of souls and the honouring of his name. Hallelujah! New hope. Life lived with the knowledge that in Christ we are more than conquerors and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! We know that no power can snatch us out of the hand of God. It is our guaranteed hope that in Christ Jesus we are eternally secure and that at the end we will be gathered up into the heavenly glorious kingdom of mighty God, our loving heavenly Father. Hallelujah! How does the psalmist put it, doing so with great confidence and conviction. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And, and so the result of Christ's life, death, resurrection and ascension into glory is that we have an amazing destiny. What wonderful destiny is ours to anticipate. We will at the end be changed in the twinkling of an eye as we are wonderfully made ready to meet our Lord and Saviour in the very moment of entering his heavenly, glorious and eternal kingdom there to enjoy the place he has prepared for us, there to receive our crown of glory. Then we will be able to sing in the fulfilment of our hope, the great song of Christian triumph. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The very thought of this guaranteed victory over the powers of sin and death as the heavenly trumpet sounds the note of triumph and home call, gives believers great cause to give voice to but one emotion-packed word, hallelujah. We are surely able to see in the way that the woman burst out of the tomb with a message for the disciples, who in turn would have a message for us, the beginning of of the exploding of the gospel good news of Jesus Christ into all the world. Along with the empty tomb and the testimony of the word of God, their reaction, one of determination mixed with understandable fear, is one of the great unassailable proofs of the resurrection. The cross was behind them and now they were Sunday's children, touched by the resurrection, with a gospel to proclaim, our gospel, the gospel we take into the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what a gospel it was and is, declaring of his identity, the Son of God, to whom was given by his Father in heaven, authority, glory, sovereign power and everlasting dominion, his being a kingdom that can never be destroyed. His activity, miracles, calming storms, healing the sick, transforming lives, raising the dead. Message, I am the way, the truth and the life and the only way to God. Come to me and I will give you forgiveness and rest. Method, 
to die on a cross in our place for our sins, that in him we might know new life, and on the third day his method to rise again, his destiny to return to glory and to gather his people to himself. What a gospel we have. What a gospel it is our calling to take into the world. We need to remind ourselves that he has risen, not just on Easter Sunday, but regularly, daily, we serve a risen Lord. Hallelujah. What a gospel we have. Hallelujah. You know, as Christians, that we are all Sunday's children, proof and product of the resurrection. We have been raised from death into life, hallelujah. Raised from the captivity of sin into the freedom of life in the spirit, hallelujah. Raised to a destiny that will see us entering the everlasting kingdom, hallelujah. Christ is risen and in time we will rise to be with him in glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's pray for a moment. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder that the Lord is risen, that the, the tomb could not hold him, that he is alive. He is seated at your right hand in glory. He, he rules in sovereign and in supreme fashion. We pray that we would never lose sight of this fact and that day and daily we will be energized in the service we seek to give to your kingdom. Wherever we are, help us to be faithful, help us to be fruitful, help us to be men and women full of the truth. Christ is alive and is the saviour of all who will come to him in repentance and in faith and trust. Be pleased to use us in the extension of hallelujah ministry that by the words we speak, there will yet be many who will come to faith in Jesus and knowing that they are numbered among the redeemed of God will have cause to cry out, hallelujah, amen.